One striking aspect of watching TV in the 1990s was a mix of music on TV. Yes, there were new acts, new stars, but there were also quarter century old performers who thrived during the 1990s. How did that happen? What was the true state of music on television in the 1990s? I'm Molly Pedrajic television curator at the Museum of Broadcast Communication in Chicago. I'm also the curator and writer for the current museum exhibit, Watching TV in the 1990s. With me to discuss the topic are two expert scholars on popular music. Kenneth Womack is dean at Monmouth University and author and editor of multiple books, including the Beatles Encyclopedia. Kit O'Toole, is a blog columnist and author of Songs We Were Singing, a book on Beatles music, and Michael Jackson, FAQ. Welcome. In different ways, both the Beatles and Michael Jackson epitomized unexpected success for an old time act in the 1990s. How did that happen? How did they pull that off? Kit, talk about Mike. Well, I think Michael Jackson was a master at using television to his benefit. Um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we were sort of in the last vestiges of what I would call water cooler TV, you know, <laughs> where we were all watching at one point or another. There was, of course, cable in the 90s but, and, and more channels, but we weren't watching on demand as much as we are today. Michael recognized that, and he started this in the 80s uh, when he debuted his music video on uh, MTV, on uh, Thriller. You know, that became an event that everybody saw, everybody talked about, you know. And so he built on that over time. He saw how effective that was. So in the 90s, when he came out uh, in 91, specifically with his album Dangerous, uh, he debuted Black or White on uh, MTV, BET, and Fox. And they, particularly Fox, got some of their highest ratings, you know, and he recognized that that was a way to build anticipation for the album. And of course, the song became a huge hit. The video was a bit controversial. <laughs> and he followed that up with Remember the Time, his second single. He was just a master at that. And he recognized that television was an essential part of getting his music out there. As I understand it, that he would have his music finished and then say, okay, let's put that aside. Now let's talk about the campaign. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the video. Let's talk about everything that accompanies it. Absolutely. And, uh, and he, of course, uh, raised the bar for video in general. I mean, he made it an art form. And he wanted them to be not just releases, new releases. He wanted them to be events. You know, And he was very conscious of that, for example. Well, Ken, speaking of events, <laughs> in the 1990s, the Beatles finally delivered on what they had been working on for decades, namely what later became called the Beatles Anthology, a documentary about themselves. Tell us a little bit about that and how that fit into what you see as the Beatles' viability uh, in the 90s and beyond. It was very interesting to see the Beatles create, and, and I hate to use this word, but a comeback of sorts. Uh, in the 1990s with the anthology series with ABC TV. Um, but it is fitting that it was television who had helped birth them back in February 1964 with the Ed Sullivan Show that really helped them to create this epochal moment in the mid-1990s. And they certainly needed it. Uh, the Beatles received so much media attention today in the contemporary moment. It's hard to believe that throughout the 90s, looking back, they did have some relative low spots uh, in terms of their post-disbandment history. The 80s were very tough on the Beatles. They had a lingering lawsuit uh, with the surviving Beatles, uh, Lennon's estate, versus Paul McCartney over residuals. It was settled in 1989. They were very late to the compact disc game, but they did so very shrewdly, creating a kind of blue chip product, very slowly releasing the albums over 1987 into 1988 on CD. Uh, and really the, the tables were very well set for the anthology, uh, which gave them this kind of 
space to reintroduce themselves to the fans that they'd had perhaps from the beginning, but also to do what they did best even during uh, their heyday, and that is to create new demographics. And what the anthology series did was it exploded their demographic all over again. In fact, it, I, I like to liken that series to the effect of yesterday uh, in the U.S. in 1965, mm -hmm. where the Beatles went from a kind of teen, young adult demographic to everyone. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, um, eight-year-olds like yesterday, and so did your grandmother. And uh, the, the anthology had that kind of effect for the Beatles. It really, uh, it was kind of their second reintroduction to the world. And it was a Beatles reunion. Oh, certainly. Um, and, uh, of course, a lot of Beatles scholars like to refer to it as the Threedles uh, because of uh, John Lennon's senseless murder back in 1980. Uh, and when you watch it, of course, his shadow lingers all over the place. You've got current video of the other three Beatles and then of all of this archival sound and video footage of Lennon uh, where they're trying to give him equal time. But, yeah, it was a, it was a Beatles reunion of sorts. Uh, and musically, too. I mean, they actually had a new Beatles record that was released apart from the anthology. Absolutely, with uh, the singles um, Free as a Bird and Real Love, uh, which uh, fared very, very well in, in the charts, right along with Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, there was... Uh, on the part of both the Beatles and uh, Michael Jackson, the sense of using TV. Besides music videos, uh, how did Michael Jackson in particular use the whole medium of television as a personality uh, to keep his brand fresh? Well, he did a number of things. He was very smart about giving interviews. You know, he did not go on every talk show. You know, at that point, by the early 90s, he was big enough that he didn't always, you know, really didn't need to do that. He carefully was able, you know, was able to pick and choose what he wanted to do. Uh, the uh, biggest example, of course, is the interview we did with Oprah um, in 93. Uh, that was heavily promoted and got huge ratings. Now, the thing is, he, even though uh, Oprah had mentioned on the show that she was free to ask him anything she wanted, he was still very in control of the interview. I mean, it was at his house, uh, and uh, he definitely was in complete control of the whole thing. Um, and then he gave another interview in 95, which also garnered huge ratings uh, with Diane Sawyer, um, and, and he was with his then wife, Lisa Marie Presley, and, uh, and premiered the Scream video during that time. But again, he chose that, you know, and Today's artists follow the same formula, particularly Beyonce. You know, she completely controls her image. She hasn't given a major interview in years. So he used television to his advantage in that way. So is that the lesson in part of the 1990s and music on television is total control? Oh, absolutely. And in, in the case of the anthology, um, it absolutely appealed to the Beatles uh, because of the, the idea of control. They could con control the, the shape of their story, which of course mm -hmm. has always been prone to mythologies uh, about their origin, about the making of their music, et cetera, ab about their personal lives. Uh, and the anthology gave them a space to really control that story and tell it the way they wanted. It of course had been coming for a long time. Neil Aspinall, uh, the director of Apple, had long been working on a project, I believe, called The Long and Winding Road um, that was going to be this story. Um, Lennon's death intervenes, um, other factors play out over time, including the aforementioned lawsuits. Uh, and, and the anthology sort of emerged in its place, but it really was about, to, to borrow off of Kit's word, it was about control. They were able to throw a little hagiography hey in there at times. <laughs> they were able to control the way they would answer questions and if they would answer them at all. And they were able to even control the setting, and sometimes it did border on the, on the corny. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are some of my favorite images, and I, I love teaching this in class when my students can see this, and we can ask deep questions about setting and the way stories are shaped. You'll see Paul at one point, I believe it's in the yesterday section, uh, inexplicably driving a, steering a tugboat. Um, or later, uh, you'll see him during the Beatles' breakup section sitting around a campfire. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the set often reminds me of when you go to Sears and you're in the, uh, the section with the barbecue pits and the outdoor furniture, and they have these sort of fake fire, firewood displays. It sort of looks like that, although it's real fire there. He stokes it every now and then. 
pauses from the interview to, to keep that fire burning, much like the Beatles legend. <laughs> Let me look at one other aspect of, of TV music in the 1990s, which is by the 1990s, Kitsch, you alluded to the fact that there were more choices, more cable options, still not everything on demand, but you had many different venues to uh, follow music, uh, if you will. Uh, did that atmosphere make it possible for people who cared not one whit about the Beatles to completely ignore them and still give them enough room to be successful? In other words, this was a, already a diverse lineup of, of new acts coming out. Uh, but there was enough room for the new acts to thrive as well as the classic acts to have a second bow. Well, I think um, MTV Unplugged played a huge role in that. Um, let's face it, by the early 90s, radio had changed. Um, in the past, when Paul McCartney, Rod Stewart, Eric Clapton dropped singles, they would automatically get radio airplay because of who they were. You know, they were legends. By the early 90s, radio had changed. It had become more segmented, and they weren't automatically getting airplay. It was, uh, you know, radio stations wanted to skew younger, and so how were they going to get their music out there? How were they going to show that they were still relevant? And MTV Unplugged, played a huge role in that. Look what happened when Eric Clapton did his segment. I mean, he went through a career renaissance because of that. He won Grammys uh, from the album that came out afterwards. Uh, uh, had a big hit with the unplugged version of Layla. Um, Paul McCartney came out with an album from his appearance there, which did extremely well. Rod Stewart experienced a career resurgence with uh, the, the single Have I Told You Lately. You know, he had a big hit with that. This is a way they could get their music out there and show they were still relevant. They had to look beyond radio to get airplay and to get their new stuff out there as well as play their old stuff. And Unplugged became a tremendous part of that. And Unplugged also was introducing new artists as well. Mm -hmm. One week you're going to have Paul McCartney Unplugged, the next time you might have Nirvana Unplugged. Exactly, and, and, and what Unplugged allowed folks to do, these artists to do, was to create a kind of epochal moment, right? Um, and, and, you know, we talk about the anthology series. In a lot of ways, it's kind of one of the children of the great miniseries and TV events of the 80s. You know, they were creating an event culture, and both Michael Jackson and the Beatles were really masters of this, mm -hmm. turning albums into events, yeah. Thriller, Sgt. Pepper. Uh, birthing the summer of love in many ways. These were event albums uh, that really transformed their culture. And of course, artists are still trying to create those events. I would argue it's, it's much more difficult mm -hmm. uh, given uh, the fight for TV time, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of channels, downloadable content, etc. But you see artists trying to do that. Beyonce, whom you mentioned earlier, uh, with her album that she dropped right before the, the holiday shopping season one year, trying to create their own momentum uh, in a marketplace that doesn't have a lot of give like it may have once. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, we've uh, noticed looking at the entire decade of the 1990s that that was truly a turning point decade. It was old enough so that we can look mm -hmm. back at it with nostalgia mm -hmm. and yet still fresh enough that the reverberations continue even till today. Any final words about looking at the 90s from the perspective of today? Well, again, you know, I think it was the last vestiges of water cooler TV. You know, I mean, today, as you mentioned with Beyonce, I mean, she just could not create an event quite like that. I know she premiered her new album on uh, HBO, but still, it didn't have quite the same impact that it did in the 90s. But I think. Te television and music went together extremely well. It was a combination of, along for creativity with um, music video. I mean, I think in the 90s there was a real, real renaissance that way as well. But they also, uh, artists understood that they had to have television to get heard, even when they couldn't get radio airplay. Today it's YouTube. You know, I mean, that is a huge part of it. So the 90s was definitely a decade where television still played a tremendous role in music. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, when you think about the 1990s and some of these 
really big acts we're talking about, um, a number of them continue to be beneficiaries of that moment in telling ways, while others have not. You know, I, I, I can't help, help but sit here wondering, what if the folks behind Elvis Presley Enterprises had found a way to leverage the 90s to create an Elvis epoch? That didn't happen. But Elvis's brand might be very different now. Um, whereas the folks behind Michael Jackson, behind the Beatles, um, let's even say somebody behind Rod Stewart was able to have several second and third acts later, mm -hmm. including his oldies moment, um, that may have had a lot to do with the, the landscape of the kinds of cultural forces at play in TV and music in the 90s. Thank you very much. Both of you, uh, the Museum of Broadcast Communications Watching TV in the 90s exhibit continues uh, open-ended. So stop by, go to museum.tv for more information about the Museum of Broadcast Communication. For the Museum of Broadcast Communication, I'm Walter Pedrajic.